Welcome in. This is Religionless Christianity. I'm your host, Spencer. This is my beautiful wife, Nikki. Hello. And we're so <laughs> grateful that you're joining us today. As you can tell, Nikki's voice is doing much better than it was mm-hmm. last week. Um, <laughs> so we're fired up and ready to go. Uh, if you're new here, don't let the name fool you. Um, we ourselves are very Christian. This podcast is very Christian, um, but it's more specifically the world and, you know, kind of more specifically this nation that's becoming increasingly secular, very religionless, you could say. Uh, so that at least in part is where the name comes from, you know, but how can we live a life that's pleasing to God in a religionless world? Um, that's what we will be trying to help with today, like we do every week um, by looking at stories in the news from around the world and around the country. Um, but before we dive fully into the podcast, um, is there any prayer requests, any praise reports that you have, anything you want to share with the audience? Um, I heard uh, Paul Washer had heart surgery a few days ago, uh, so keep him in prayer for recovery. I heard it went well, but I'm sure it's a long recovery. So yeah, let's keep Brother Paul Washer in our prayers. And it was just Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving if we forgot to mention it last week. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, we had a good Thanksgiving. We had friends from church invite us over. Um, they have four kids as well, and another family from church was there. So all the kids had a great time together. They all know each other already from church, and we enjoyed ourselves at our friend's house. We're very thankful that they invited us, and so praise God for good friends. (laughs) Absolutely, and yeah, please pray for Paul Washer. Um, definitely somebody near and dear to our heart, Mm -hmm. and we were coming... Up in our, you know, faith, Paul Washer was one of the... I know. You know, I think even now, you know, his famous, you know, sort of message that will shock the youth or whatever that message was called. He really, yeah, to the youth, his message. It's still a great message, I think. And from what I read, he actually had a heart attack, I think, in 2017 as well. So he's had heart trouble for a while now. So just pray that the Lord would give him a few more years of fruitful ministry. Uh, I know we would be blessed by it, and I'm sure the world would be blessed by Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So, yeah, please pray for that. And then, um, yeah, no real prayer request, praise report, just Thanksgiving was great. Yeah, praise God that that I'm better. And Nikki's better. Uh, And your checkup at the doctor went well from her surgery. So things are looking up. The Lord is doing all right with us. So, yeah. So just a question for the audience. What is your favorite Thanksgiving dessert? I keep seeing some really good stuff. People are still sharing, even after Thanksgiving, (laughs) all their recipes. And I'm like, I could have made that one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's a tough list. I mean, you know, obviously the standard is pumpkin pie, but I don't know that that's actually the favorite anymore. Even as much as I love pumpkin spice and all things pumpkin, like really when you (laughs) stack it, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like your favorite because it's what you can eat a lot of, whereas it's like... There are certainly things that taste better, but you don't want it all the time. Like a pecan pie is awesome. Yeah. You're like, man, it's so rich. I don't know. I mean. I need like a different version of pecan. Like the pie, I think it's always like too much of that filling. Like it's way too rich, but I want all of that going on. Yeah. In a different. Yeah. the, The filling can be a bit much. They had a cherry pie there that was delicious. I'm a big cherry pie fan. Really good. Um. But I know there's probably some, you know, kind of local traditions, I just, you know, probably that we aren't aware of. So yeah. love, you know, her mom makes fudge for Christmas and stuff yeah. like that. That's kind of a big deal in Michigan, the fudge. But um, yeah, let us know. What's your sort of, maybe both. What's your go-to Thanksgiving dessert? And then what's your favorite? Because I think those are two yeah. different things. Like pumpkin pie is my favorite or my go-to. I'm sorry, but like favorite you know, ah, my daughter made me a sweet potato cheesecake one time. That was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, anything <laughs> cheesecake is probably high on my list. So, yep. yeah. Anyways, um, let us know in the comments what you guys, uh, I think I asked you last week if you're turkey or ham folk, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dessert? That would be a good one. Everybody likes to talk about sweets. <laughs> it's more fun. All right. So next question, what are we thankful for? Yeah. So um, I'll just go first. As far as for me, what I'm thankful for, and it's kind of cliche, I get it, but I'm thankful for this podcast. Uh, I'm thankful for what it's allowed us to do for the last two and a half years. 
you know, it's really, especially for me, it's given me an outlet um, to really discuss matters of faith and godliness, mm-hmm. which has become increasingly important for me. I don't have very many outlets, you know, to do that. So this podcast is great. It's also brought us, you know, new and very unique people into our lives. And that's been great. In fact, just this past week, it brought two new people into our life just through like them reaching out to us about things they wanted us to discuss. And next week, we're going to start probably at least a two part uh, series kind of talking about this girl's book that she sent us about Sarah Young fascinating book Mm -hmm. so we're probably going to look at that next week but just we would have never met this woman Mm -hmm. um and just the people in the comments and uh you know having interviews with james white you know who would have thought and andrew rapaport coming on here has been fantastic so just what it's been allowed us to do for the last couple years has been great um but then you know i would also say we're thankful for our church we talked about the great friends that we had thanksgiving at Um, the church, you know, being a part of that, it's brought, um, wonderful people into our lives, godly people into our lives, our children's lives, um, which is a huge blessing. Mm -hmm. And then also they've, you know, if I've told you guys on here, they've given me the opportunity to sort of pursue this, um, dream and the passion that I have to preach and, um, become a pastor. And they're sorting to, uh, giving me the space and the opportunity to do that. So what a blessing Mm -hmm. our church is. So two great things to be thankful for. Yeah, there's a lot to be thankful for. And I know uh, life is just busy and I'm glad we have this holiday for us to really stop and and pause and and thank God um, for so many things that we take for granted. So, you know, it's always the small things we overlook. So I am thankful for those everyday things. Somebody posted something, and I know I've seen it before, but it always like really uh, just makes me want to cry. <laughs> you know, thankful for dirty laundry. Like it means like a bunch of kids clothes to wash. It means I have a full house. You know, people live here, dirty dishes, people are eating well. Um, just all the things you would normally complain about, the messes, the work to do, it means you have a home. And yeah, thankful for all those things that I probably complain about a lot, actually. I will try to remember that next time I go downstairs and the (laughs) kitchen sink is filled with dirty dishes. Say, thank you, God, I have a family to take care of. I'll say, thank you, God, I have a family. Kids, get out here. Yeah. (laughs) Probably be both of those, but that's all right. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. Duh. There's so many things. We we probably complain more than we thank God for things. And yes. That's something I need to work on. But yeah, the same thing Spencer said, um, moving so often, which hopefully we don't have to move anymore. Like, probably not. <laughs> but it's hard always adjusting, finding the church that you want to stay at and your kids making friends. You know, as they get older, that's always like a bigger deal. Your kids having friends, especially as teenagers. And God has really blessed our kids. They have friends that are Christians here. Uh, that come from really good Christian homes. Um, Yeah, I'm just, I just thank God for that. That is so important. We did not have that growing up. And I know godly friends is a, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot to be thankful for. All right. With all the Thanksgivings out of the way, um, what did we have in the news this week? We saw Israel and Hamas negotiate a ceasefire. Um. Israel-Hamas war, the hostage deal, and ceasefire explained. This is from Reuters. Israel and Palestinian Islamist group Hamas will start a four-day truce on Friday morning with the first batch of Israeli hostages released later that day, mediators in Qatar said. Under the Israel-Hamas deal, the two sides agreed to a four-day truce so that 50 women and children under the age of 19 taken hostage could be freed in return for 150 Palestinian women and teenagers in Israeli detention. The 50 hostages, among about 240 taken by Hamas in their October 7th raid on Israel, are expected to be released in batches, probably about a dozen a day, during the four-day ceasefire. Those involved in the deal have described the break in hostilities a humanitarian pause. 
The pause will be extended by a day for each additional batch of 10 hostages released, Israel said in a statement. Yeah, so, you know, a bit of good news there, I would say, um, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But, you know, getting hostages released is always a positive, I think. Um, we'll have to see how this actually shakes out. And we got this story um, a few days ago. So the ceasefire has kicked off. And the last I saw on Friday, they had actually released 39 already. So they're at least keeping their word at some level of releasing these people. So that's good. Um, it also says in here, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, I don't know. It'll be in the article. Um, we'll have this link down in the show notes. But they mentioned that um, during the truce, uh, it says during the truce, trucks loaded with aid and fuel are expected to cross into Gaza, where 2.3 million people have been running out of food. And many hospitals have shut down in part because they no, no longer have fuel for the generators. Um, so that's a positive as well. Um, they're getting some probably much needed aid to the civilian populace. You know, you know, again, is it good? Is it bad? You know, hopefully it works out well. People get the care that they need mm -hmm. um, and the hostages get released. But that's something that happened this week. All right. Another thing that happened, a porn star accused of 34 counts of rape was released uh, from custody to a private residence. Says former porn star Ron Jeremy released to a private residence due to his deteriorating health. This is from the Blaze Media. And it reads, former porn star Ron Jeremy, who was accused of rape by more than 20 women, will be released to a private residence due to his deteriorating health. Jeremy, whose full name is Ronald Jeremy Hyatt, was first charged with 34 counts of sexual assault in 2020, including 12 counts of rape. The allegations stemmed as far back as 1996, and the alleged victims ranged in age from 15 to 51. Yeah, uh, crazy. I mean, think about that. Rape allegations <clears throat> <laughs> involving children as young as 15 years old. Now, Ron Jeremy, uh, he's old, close to death, it would seem. But I wanted to highlight this for a reason, because um, I don't think we talk about it quite as often as we probably should. But, you know, your support for pornography or just your usage and consumption of pornography, which is the same thing, you know, your usage and consumption is effectively it equates to support of pornography. Um, that is your support for rape. It's your support for drug usage, alcoholism, abuse, the trafficking that comes along and everything wicked and evil about pornography, uh, because there's nothing porn or there's nothing about pornography that isn't wicked and evil. Uh, so if you are still partaking in this evil and wicked enterprise, you need to stop immediately, and you need to seek God repentant or repentance with God intensely, um, mm -hmm. because Ron Jeremy is just one of I'm certain many 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 men. Uh, who are probably guilty of much the same thing. And these girls that he assaulted are just a few of many, many, many who have been assaulted and harmed in the exact same way. Um, and you can't turn a blind eye to, you know, participating in the sin and think that you're somehow not involved. Um, you are. You're right. supporting it and you're promoting it and you're keeping that um, wicked enterprise going. So that's please how, stop. That's how sin works. It starts out with something... And then it goes to the next thing and the next thing. And it's just like a snowball. A snowball yep. effect. Yeah, it's evil. There's nothing good about it. All right, the next one. Uh, we saw the city of Port Wentworth, Georgia, settle a lawsuit for arresting a man for holding a sign outside City Hall that read, God bless the homeless vets. So the article reads, man arrested for holding sign at City Hall settles lawsuit. Uh, this is from Christian Post. The city issued an apology to Jeff Gray and agreed to submit a notice to the police. Port Wentworth law enforcement officers and City Hall employees explaining that the area in front of Port Wentworth City Hall is a traditional public forum that may be used by members of the public for expressive activity, including demonstrations, protests, petitioning, and holding signs. 
Yep. So uh, <laughs> local city leadership in Georgia, Port Wentworth, Georgia, they had to be reminded through legal action that their citizens have the right to make their thoughts and their views known to their leaders. And uh, <laughs> crazy times we live in. But if you watch the video, which is linked in the article, and again, we'll have the article linked to the show notes. So go to the link to find the link. But if you watch the video, it's interesting because the cop comes out, you know, he's directed by the women that are working in this city hall building uh, that they don't like the guy out there. And the cop goes out and, you know, talks to the guy, asks him why he's there. And he tells him, you're not breaking any laws, but we need you to leave. They want you to leave the premise. He's like, you're not breaking any laws. And the guy's like, no, I'd rather stay. And then the cop goes back in. And they talk to him, uh, you know, to the ladies again. And then somehow, so that happens in the first two minutes. Ten minutes later, somehow the guy's being arrested and drug off. <laughs> like, thought he wasn't breaking any laws. Um, but, you know, hmm. ten minutes later, he's arrested. So there you go. Land of the free, am I right? Good hmm. old stars and bars, huh? It's crazy how their made-up laws, you know, make you break the real laws. It makes me think of the Pharisees making up their extra laws, and they're actually breaking God's law. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And again, they could be right. I'm not going to lambaste the, the cops here, but they talked about how it's trespassing, you know, because the city property is essentially private property, and you can't be on it. And I was like, seems weird to me, I guess, but uh, what do I know? Um, but either way, uh, so you're not area, breaking any laws, but now you're arrested. What it was used for that says... Like they Interesting use, story. I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. again, you're in Port Wentworth, Georgia. You get locked up <sighs> for expressing your views too close to your supposed, you know, public servants, if you will. Anyway. Yep. All right. What else happened? All right. We saw a San Diego pastor sue over being removed from a city board due to his LGBTQ beliefs. So pastor sues over removal from city board due to LGBTQ beliefs from also the Christian Post. And it says the San Diego County Human Relations Commissioner and pastor has filed a lawsuit against San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria for removing him from a city board, alleging discrimination against his religious beliefs. The action followed the pastor's absten abstention from a vote condemning transphobia, citing his Christian faith. A video from the meeting shows that the agenda item in question was a letter from the City of San Diego Human Relations Commissioner Tutti, that's his name, Tutti Thomas, regarding... it's a woman. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, regarding ending discrimination and transphobia by amplifying the visibility and voices of the transgender community. The lawsuit attributed Hodges', Hodges' abstention vote to his religious beliefs, specifically because the agenda, the agenda item conflicted with his Christian beliefs on creation, God's design for humankind, and human sexuality. When asked about his abstention at the meeting, Hodges assured his fellow commissioners, I love all people, I love transgenders as well. But to me, it's an abomination to the eyes of God, so I don't agree with it. In August 2023, Gloria used the authority granted by the city charter to veto Hodges' reappointment to the San Diego Citizens Advisory Board on Police Community Relations. The lawsuit cites a memorandum from Gloria highlighting Hodges' comments about the LGBT community, particularly trans-identified individuals, as a reason for his dismissal from the city board. Woo! I don't know this guy, but man, I love this guy. Uh, can, what's his name, Daniel Hodges? Can Daniel Hodges run for president? Uh, love a guy who actually stands for his Christian convictions. Uh, pretty rare these days. <laughs> um, but you know, this is just kind of your run-of-the-mill, as I call it, the intolerance of the inclusivity crowd. Mm -hmm. Right. This guy removed for um, what is kind of the new American standard anymore, especially in these, you know, inner cities, these big, you know, metropolitan cities. It's the legal standard of thought mm -hmm. crimes. Right. Mm -hmm. He has no history of 
you know, transphobia, no evidence of transphobia or discrimination, anything of that sort. Right. He just didn't think properly. So now he loses his post. Isn't that crazy? Yep. Land of the free, am I right? As long as you think properly, you can do as you wish, right? That thinking gets out of line. Well, then old Todd Gloria is going to run you out of your post there in San Diego. People, yeah, this is going to be like a test of faith. Like, I, do you even want to let people know you're a Christian? Well, these are kind of those little micro persecutions that right. I would yeah. assume are forerunners to real persecution. So if you're not willing to stand and actually, you know, like Daniel Hodges, if you would have caved on this and said, oh, fine, I'll sign. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to stand to just lose a random commissionership. He's still a pastor, still whatever he is. He just lost a seat on a board. If you're not willing to lose a seat on the board, what are the odds you're going to go and stand before Caesar when he's going to chop your head off unless you denounce Christ? Unlikely, right? So these little micro persecutions, while they may be minuscule and, you know, not really that big of a deal now, um, it's sort of building that thick skin to prepare you for potentially real persecution later. So, you know, don't dismiss these little micro persecutions. You know, um, like the the fellow we talked about just before, Jeff Gray or whatever his name was, the guy out in front of the Port Wentworth City Hall, a little micro persecution, a little bit of inconvenience. You know, are you going to fold after that or are you going to accept it and be like, hey, man, this is the price of doing business in America nowadays. If I want to stand for God and his created order, this is kind of the price of doing business now. So um, kudos to him. Yeah, it's Good really um, revealing who true believers are with, like you said, micro persecutions. Like it's really <laughs> separating. We're seeing a lot. Yeah, it's very revealing, sadly. <sighs> okay, the next one. Um, we saw the Evangelical Theological Society appoint their first female president. Uh, first woman steps into leadership of Evangelical uh, Theological Society. Uh, this is from Christianity Today. It reads, the Evangelical Theological Society has instated its first female president in 75 years. Karen, how do you say her last name? Jobes? Jobes, I would assume. Okay. Karen Jobes, Emeritus Professor of New Testament and Exegesis at Wheaton College, will lead the Professional Society of Evangelical Bible Scholars and Theologians in 2024. Yeah, this one stood out to me when I saw it because our pastor in Florida, he would go to the Evangelical Theological Society meetings every year, and the... Mm. Few, the two times that he went while we were there, he would bring back what he had learned and sort of discuss it on uh, some of the Sundays. And it was always pretty good stuff. So um, this stood out to me. But mm -hmm. this article, boy, it was prime today's Christianity.com. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, it was. They love to, yeah. Yeah, this was their wheelhouse here. Um, they talk about a ton in this article. So they got the first female president, and they talked a lot in this article about the challenges and just how challenging it's been for women that went to ETS all these decades, you know, because there were so few women. And they make mention in there that the challenges that these women would face is that the men that were at ETS would ask them in the hallway, whose husband or who was their husband that they were there with? Like, that was the big challenge. We didn't think that you were here on your own. We assumed you were here with your husband. Oh, how dare you? <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised those women got out of bed in the morning. My goodness, can you imagine that? Somebody assumed that you were married and asked where your husband... Like, that was the great discrimination that Christianity Today highlighted multiple times in this article. Uh, they had to answer a few questions. Wow. Shocking. Um, but really, all mm -hmm. of this sounds like a bunch of nothing to me. Um you know, in my opinion, if there's women at ETS, great. Uh, if there weren't any women at ETS, great. It makes no difference to me. And I'm assuming it makes no difference to anybody who's not just a slave to gender and race. Um, makes no difference, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is the Bible in theology, what's being discussed there. Whether it's coming out of a woman's mouth or a man's mouth, makes no difference, right? Same thing with the race. It doesn't matter if a black guy is doing it or a white guy is doing it. Is what they're doing good? Good. Mm -hmm. Is what they're doing bad? Bad, right? 
Um, that's the way a sane person should think. But um, that was, at least that was my thought in the article until you get down to this one section. Let me try to find it. Mm, right here. It says, the effort to include more women in ETS has not only been led by women, those involved are quick to point out. <clears throat> they say many men, including some who are complementarians, have worked to make the association more hospitable for women. So like they're su surprised. Yep. You know, so the women are fighting to have their, you know, voices heard and to be recognized in the hallways <laughs> as being there on their own. And the complementarian men are right there behind them. So, you know, when I read that, it was so this is less biblical, but just more accommodating to women is the point, right? <sighs> and does that not just sum up American Christianity? It's it's just that they like to take something and make it, I don't know. They like to get people hyped up. Yeah. Christianity. Yeah. And it's not even like they just looked around and went, ah, you know what? There's not a lot of women here. We should try to get more women. It's like somehow, yes, because the women have been oppressed. That's why they're not here. That's just the way it is no, today. It That's probably how everything's was been. just that women didn't go because men mostly went. And then women decided to start coming more and more. So now there's more women. Like, Isn't there's not weird? always some great oppressor. Is that going to stop someday? This whole oppression thing, convincing people, this is the reason why oppression. Yeah. You were being Maybe held back and you a didn't lot know of women it. There. <laughs> you know, like you don't look around at like, you know, a steel factory and you're like, why aren't there more women in this steel factory? Bunch of oppressive men. No, it's a steel factory, dude. Nobody wants to work there, least of all women. Um, but yeah, yeah, so ETS, in my mind, I read that one paragraph and then walking away from the Bible in order to accommodate the culture. Um, so who knows? Maybe Rick Warren will lead ETS here soon uh, once oh, he's man. tired of Spurgeon's College. <clears throat> who knows? Hmm. All right, what else do we have? Uh, Church of England. Um, they proceed in heresy <laughs> in advance, <laughs> blessing same-sex marriage. Okay. It says Church of England approves trial same-sex blessings. This is from Christian Post. It says the Church of England has decided to proceed with trial blessing services for same-sex couples. This decision made during the General Synod marks a significant shift in the denomination's stance on same-sex relationships. The Reverend Neil Barber from Derby and the Reverend Ian Paul from Southwell and Nottingham raised concerns about the perceived abandonment of doctrine and the need for integrity and transparency. The watching world sees that the Church of England is dumping its doctrine, even though we assert that legally we are not. But they know that we are not doing nothing. They see that we are changing doctrine, he reiterated. Yes, we are seeing it. We are aware of it. <laughs> we know what's happening. Yeah, it's happening everywhere. Uh, yeah, so here we have, you know, last <clears throat> week it was the Catholic Church, the Church of England this week. They appear to be in a race to see who can <laughs> drag their congregants to the gates of hell faster. Uh, but that's interesting, right? What's a trial blessing a trial yeah. blessing service. Like, you're just going to see how willing your members are to welcome sin into their church. Yeah, I think that's got to be what it means. I don't know what else. Well, sadly, unfortunately, uh, I'm sure they will find their members most accommodating, <laughs> I would assume. Uh, I hope not. Hopefully there's an uproar and they throw some of these people out. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, everyone in there in the Church of England is going, yeah, we know what you're doing. Uh, you can say what you want, but we kind of see what you're doing. Um, it's not right. You're leaving biblical orthodoxy, mm -hmm. changing church doctrine, and the Church of England's like, anywho, press on, bless the same-sex unions. Um, I don't know. I guess has there ever been a church movement in church history that was that thrived and um, was successful? in growing the church that was built off of accepting of sin right, and yeah. dismissing biblical doctrine. Mm. Was there ever a church uh, movement 
built on those that was successful and grew the church and made it stronger? I would venture to guess no. Um, but the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church, they are trying their darndest to see if that's possible. They're going to be relevant somehow or another, hmm. even if they completely abandon the Bible and everything it's supposed to stand for. There you go. <sighs> All right, what else do we have? Have any ever turned away after being accepting of same-sex marriage? Have they thought, no, that was a bad idea? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked that it would up. be interesting. I'm not sure, you know, uh, maybe not on the large scale. But, yeah, I mean, that would be interesting. If there ever somebody that just went, boy, uh, really thought we were trying to be more accommodating, and that got way out of hand, Yeah, and I was wrong. I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're the kind of person that has the pride to mm. look at the Bible and then look God in the eye and say, we're doing it a different way. I you know. may not be the kind of person that has the humility to go, yeah, I was wrong. I yeah, so who knows? All right, next, uh, we saw the embarrassing and heartbreaking acceptance of sin from a 50-year-old divorce. Divorcee. Divorce. Oh, sorry. <laughs> a divorced woman. Um, she says, I got married quickly in my 20s after getting pregnant. Now I'm 53, divorced. Solo, po I might say this wrong, polyamorous, and will never go back to monogamy. This is from Yahoo. Um, she said, I started practicing polyamory because I didn't want that prescribed relationship thing. It's giving me flexibility. It's more aligned with where I am right now in my life and is nourishing to me. Oh, my you know, and I couldn't find that quote there on the screen, but the article will be linked, of course. But, you know, there's a sense of happiness. I think you have a sense of happiness in selfishness, you know, but mm -hmm. I think that is moment to moment happiness and it's not joy and it certainly isn't godly, you know, and we as believers are called to be loving, of course, and that love, though, is to be a Christ-like love, you know, and Christ-like love is sacrificial. You know, it's personal, mm -hmm. it's active. That's kind of what I talked about in my sermon, which is up now at the Patreon site if you want to go give it a listen and critique it. But, um, and that's the same kind of love as Paul defines it, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, but there's nothing about selfishness, um, which we see from this story, that is Christ-like. Um, so I mm -hmm. think a huge warning sign um, for Christian folk out there. Yeah. All right, lastly, the icing on the cake. We have the story from The Blaze. Destructive deer-eating super pigs invade northern U.S. from Canada. All right, destructive super pigs from Canada are beginning to invade the U.S., threatening to add to the billions of dollars in damage already inflicted annually upon the nation by feral swine. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really scary. They're... It's horrifying. <laughs> um, and do we need any further evidence of God's judgment on the West? Like, <laughs> this is a, you know, Egyptian plague coming to the West is what it reads like when you read this story. Just This is the 11th plague of Egypt right now. Because the story goes on to say in here... Um, let me see if I can find it. It says, <laughs> brutal Canadian winters toughened up the pigs, which Brooks stressed will <laughs> feed on anything. They gobble up tons of goslings and ducklings in the spring. They can take down a white-tailed deer, even an adult. And then it goes down here, it says, extra to devouring crops and, everything, or, and anything with a pulse. The wild <laughs> pigs are also known to carry diseases like Swine fever. Um, awesome. Yikes. We're going to have a new... Look, they're going to use this now and, you know, a new variant or something. It could it's be. going to come out now. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah. yeah it's going to come back. Incredible they story. use this? The 11th plague coming on the West. And we were just talking with... I don't know if you were standing there when... Um, 
I was talking to, I think his name was Lou, the guy with the necklace with the bear claw at Thanksgiving. And he was talking about hunting and, um, and he, I think it's in Texas. There's a bunch of hogs that yeah. they just let anybody, like it's just open season. Anybody, you don't need a permit. Go and yeah. get them. Yeah. yeah, you can just shoot. I mean, I think there's places like that with like coyotes and there's different things like that with <clears> fish <throat> and stuff as well where like just catch all of them you can and Yeah, kill them, and with the know, snakes in Florida. Stuff. But yeah. here we have wild African swine infested pigs. Um, you know, it's interesting. You think the future that like we'd be, you know, you watch Terminator and we're going to be battling, you know, cyborgs in the streets for our humanity when it turns out it's just you know pigs that have been hardened in the brutal canadian winters that are just overrunning us we're going to be fighting them in the streets you know what i just Uh, saw this video today actually um just a facebook reel i don't know i don't know why i have certain ones pop up but (laughs) it was a black bear climbing over a pig pen like a pretty high fence and the pig kept charging at him like he knew he was climbing over but the bear climbed in anyway and those pigs just started charging at him that bear got out so quick and like bears are scared of these things just wait till it's you that those (laughs) pigs are charging Um, i know it's not gonna be great aren't the holidays magical folks Um, (laughs) happy holidays uh so we just want to focus on one of these stories. Um, but before we get to the main story, I just want to make a few points uh, about some of the other ones that we mentioned earlier. The first one in regards to Mr. Gray, that Jeff Gray fella, the man outside the city hall, uh, like we were kind of talking about with the micro persecutions, I just can't help to feel that this stuff is all on purpose. You know, these government officials know what they're doing. They know that it's against the law, right? This city lost in court. They have to pay a fine. Um, They know that it's against the Constitution, but they don't care because Mm -hmm. they're simply not going to be held to account for it. You know, they can arrest the person, they can lose in court, ah, pay a small fine, and then just get right back to business, knowing that like a simple act of harassing like this for the citizenry, it's going to dissuade a majority of the people that would otherwise protest because they don't want to go through this hassle. Um, You know, I think this is largely what we've seen with the January 6th arrests. Um, just on a much larger scale, but, you know, hit them hard, right? To where, no, you know, everyone else, the normal person goes, mm, it's probably not worth my time to go protest there because I ain't trying to get locked up either, right? So you sort of scare the populace into getting too bold, um, mm. you know, outside of your comfort zone as a leader there. And I think it's, you know, shame on these leaders. But again, I think this is that sort of simple persecution, the micro persecutions, that we really ought to get comfortable with um, as our nation becomes more wicked and godless. You know, I d- does not mean that we should be quiet. Right. For we should sure. fight against that. Yeah. Yeah. Legally, within our rights, yeah. um, we should stand and fight. Mm-hmm. Just understand what's coming, right? You know, the same thing with that, um, that pastor, Daniel Hodges. You know, just understand you may lose your job. You may lose your post, right? Um, that sort of thing. But you're just going to have to you know, be aware of the, um, the consequences before you step into that arena and be willing to, you know, pay the price, I guess, whatever happens to be. And I think it's very sneaky and actually very clever, um, to slowly, you know, start with these micro persecutions because a lot of people are just going to get used to it, but accepting it like, oh, it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Like get comfortable in the wrong way. But if they just came out and just were just persecuting Christians, you know, like it is in other countries, people would stand against that. But when it's slowly, you know, the frog and the water that's slowly coming to a boil type of thing, yeah. where people don't even like notice that this is the path we're on. Yeah, so. I think it's smart. I mean, that's essentially what, you know, progressivism is. It's that slow mm-hmm. march, you know, towards communism yeah. rather than the yep. radical bloodshed that just a normal communist takeover would, you know, have. Progressive is that is the frog in the pot. That's what it is designed to be. So, yeah. um, but then secondly, the the deer-eating pigs, the human-eating pigs, if you will. I think what's so fascinating about this story is that this is largely the product of man's doing. 
you know, this article kind of talks about how these pigs were brought over from Europe to be cultivated in Canada and this sort of stuff. And then, of course, it gets out of control, right? And now the pigs are running wild, hardened from the Canadian winters. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. It's just, it's man in our infinite, you know, prideful arrogance. Again, deciding to, you know, we're going to cultivate these pigs in North America. And then, of course, you know, they run wild. It gets out of control, goes off the rails, explodes into an epidemic. Of course, right? But don't worry. Don't worry. Nothing like this will ever happen with the climate. Nothing like this will ever happen with the food supply, medicine, none of that what stuff. What do you do if they're like taking over your, your farm or something? But you're not allowed to own firearms. <laughs> yes, call, uh, call the police. They will be there in two to six hours. Oh, I'd love to see that. That'd and, be funny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> all your animal control. They'll round them up. No way. Um, they're going to be begging people. To go buy guns it's then. It's crazy, right? It's always this. It's always man, you know, tinkering with something, trying to alter something because we just assume that we know best. You know, it's just, uh, but never again, don't worry. This is a standalone issue. Just trust the science, trust the government, you know, just make sure you hide your kids from those 400 pound deer eating swine. Uh, before you uh, trust in the science there. What a time for them to start coming down this way is it's getting really cold. There's no crops for them to eat. They're going to be coming after, you know, your pets, your yeah, farm Yeah, they were running or... through the, uh, the countryside of Canada in the brutal Canadian winters. What do you think they're going to do down here in the mild, you know, Midwestern winters? They're going to be thriving down here. Good luck. Um, but... The story that I really wanted to focus for this week was the 53-year-old woman, um, the polyamorous Jenny, Jennifer Keller is her name. You know, I thought this story was very interesting. So for those that don't know, um, it says, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, polyamorous, or she says solo polyamorous. You know, you got to have your... Uh, your identity on top of your identity there. She's solo polyamory, which means having multiple partners, no primary partner, and an independent lifestyle. So this is slightly different from what we would consider like an open relationship. That's kind of a more familiar term for me. Um, as I would consider, this is kind of a fancy term for what we used to call them as a player, right? You just, you're a player. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's less classy words for what we used to say women were who did this sort of thing, but I won't utter them on this I show. I don't know. Maybe because it's a woman talking about it, she makes it sound nicer. <laughs> well, they certainly do try to dress it up in this article, you know, and make it sound like she's independent, you know, and these sorts of things. Oh but so God. why discuss this topic? You know, uh, many of you listening, I would imagine, are not polyamorous. <laughs> You're not in polyamorous relationships. and would never be in one. But I think the reason this is important to discuss is because we live in a world um, where we have family. We've got friends and we've got children that are and can be influenced by this world. And unless you're aware of it, you can't really speak against it. You know, it made me think of the Apostle John. You know, if he was never made aware of Gnosticism in his time, we might not have his gospel, you know, or it could have been written quite differently from what we have today. But John was combating a worldview and a belief system that he didn't believe in. You know, he wasn't a Gnostic, but he was doing it for our benefit so that we would have the truth of who Christ was. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do here, um, highlighting Jennifer Keller, you know, so that if you ever come across someone like Jennifer Keller, or your kids come across someone like Jennifer Keller, um, at least you're slightly more prepared to deal with it. That's kind of the reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's some larger truths that we as Christians can glean from this article on Jennifer Keller. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you want to read these first couple of points that I have here? All right. Jennifer Keller, 53, got pregnant in her 20s and stayed with the father for 13 years. After they divorced, she discovered polyamory and has been solo polyamorous for three years. She says, I was married for 13 years. We got married after only five months together. 
because I was pregnant with our first child. We had another child and worked together for 13 years to try to create a successful marriage, but there was a fundamental incompatibility. It just reached a point where we thought maybe we would be better off not being together. After our marriage ended in 2011, I was in a series of long-term monogamous relationships and polyamory really was not on my radar. I was just browsing the internet one day when I came across this polyamory thing. Reading more about it, I thought it sounded like something that was aligned with where I was then in my life. I was teaching and writing my PhD dissertation, essentially working two full-time jobs. So my life was very, very full, but at the same time, I had needs for connection, intimacy, and pleasure. Wow. I think about what Nikki just read here. You know, here we have this highly educated, you know, at this time, maybe 40, 50-year-old mother um, who goes online and has her mind infected Mm -hmm. with this selfish and sinful Mm -hmm. lifestyle, and she succumbs to it. How did Highly she, educated. I just wonder, how did she stumble upon this? Like, what kind of a Probably site was she already on? Surfing Craigslist ads I <laughs> for late night friendships. But I don't know. But, like, she succumbed to it. Mm-hmm. Now, think about, like, what are the chances your 13 or 16-year-old son or daughter has mm-hmm. in these same spheres when they stumble across it? On the same social media platforms, same websites she was probably on. Mm-hmm. This stuff is poison to all of our minds, you know, but your kids, our kids, especially, right, they're not prepared to defend against this sort of stuff. Um, So you, again, this is why we're making you aware of it. You've got to be the one to defend for them, um, again, by preventing them from getting on there in the first place, but then being able to speak against this lunacy, if it ever does crop up. You know, this is like knowledge of, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil type of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we as believers, we're supposed to guard our hearts and our minds. We're supposed to take captive our thoughts, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so as to not let those sinful thoughts and desires just kind of take hold of us, because they will if we just ruminate on them all the time. They will take hold of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I think social media, it's got to be used like prescribed medication, right? Like (sighs) you're given it for a specific purpose, for a specific time, and then you're, you're off, or else I think we're all liable to sort of fall into a similar trap like Jennifer Keller here, the or especially with, your kids. The thing with just being on a screen, it's a time when your eyes are alone. Everybody has their own screen. They can easily keep it private. You can be in the same room with your kids and your spouse, and you can be watching things you shouldn't be watching. Like it's such a private secret thing to have your very own phone. And it's just a the way for the enemy to come at you when you're alone. And we're alone and tempted several hours of every day, even being surrounded by people. We are alone in in that screen. Um, well, nobody knows mention, what you're doing, what you're alone looking at. alone in your thoughts with right. whatever that screen or that text on the screen is giving you. Yes. And you're just tossing it around up there, right? So It used to dangerous. not be so common for people to be alone. Um, We need accountability. We need to be in places where we wouldn't do something because there's other people around. I mean, people used to have to go to, you know, um, the movie store and go back in the room where there was a curtain. You know, there was a curtain. And we never, I never went back there. I'm sure a bunch of bad teenagers did. But it was like a curtain, but probably, you know, to protect kids from seeing, but it's also like, you don't want anybody to see you. You're back there looking at, we you know, want you're you trying to, know to get that the you're movies. you're going somewhere sh- seedy when you walk in there. Right. But now people don't have to do that. They can easily do everything in secret and don't have to be afraid of somebody finding out. Well, and you also get the added benefit of people like Yahoo News coming to write a glowing report about your seedy and lustful behaviors. But this is like pride that she would even say all this. It's so prideful. No, and that's what we're about to get into here with her. Um, She says in this article going on, she says, so in 2020, I started practicing polyamory because I didn't want that prescribed relationship thing. 
It's giving me flexibility. It's more aligned with where I am right now in my life. And it's nourishing to me. Nourishing. That sounds, that's a positive word there. You don't want her to be malnourished. (laughs) Right. And, you know, this is what I mentioned earlier, I think. This is that Mm self-centered, you know, selfish life that she's living now and Yahoo's praising her for. It's about her and her happiness. And again, this is a total unchristlike mentality. And just to her point on marriage, you know, the point of a biblical marriage is not you and your pleasure and happiness. Right. Um, in fact, I would venture that is kind of at least part of the reason why marriage is in such shambles in our nation today, um, because that's what people seek in marriage. Um, but biblical marriage is about that true Christ-like love, as we were mentioned before, which is sacrificial love. You know, it's about putting your spouse above yourself, you know, um, about, you know, seeking to do what's best for them. It's about building families and generations that, uh, of God-honoring offspring. You know, this to me seems to be lost on so much of America. You know, I think it's why verses like Titus chapter 2, verse 3 and 5 don't really make sense in America today. You know, why would, why would Paul instruct that older women should teach younger women to love their husbands and their children? It doesn't make sense today because, you know, our own love and, you know, or what we would probably say today is our personal happiness. Um, that's our primary goal in marriage today, but that's not the primary goal of marriage. You know, you get married for the right reasons and then you work on loving the person you're married to. I think that's kind of probably the way it worked back then, which is why Paul is saying, hey, have those older women teach the younger women they need to love their husbands. They need to love their children because they probably didn't get married out of butterflies in the stomach, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Isn't it funny how this woman and many other people do the same? They boast about how hard they worked on their PhD or whatever they're working on and boast about their two full-time jobs, but they won't work hard for their marriage? Which is harder? Yeah. Hey, my family fell apart, but I'm a doctor. You're like, all right. Yeah. Great. Like you obviously <laughs> got it in you to do hard things. Well, and we're going to highlight <laughs> later in this article what the incompatibility was with her husband. She makes it clear what that incompatibility right. was. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, it is. It's always, you know, shocking or embarrassing or shameful when someone's like, I'm a hard worker and I go the extra mile and I let my marriage fail. My kids don't know who me, who I am anymore. You're like... I think you chose the wrong one there, uh, but hey, you got your doctorate, so it's funny. Our right? boys filled out an application online, and like, I don't know how many what questions were on there, but they made a big deal about a people person. They're asking me if I'm a people person. <laughs> like, um, your employer wants you to be a people person, but you're not a people person if you don't take care of your family. You abandon your family. No. <laughs> yeah, that's your first uh, first people you need to care about. Um, You know, but in this nation, I think, you know, largely we get married for the wrong reasons and then we get divorced because that so-called, you know, the love fades away or whatever. And we have no real grander view of marriage than just our own personal happiness. That's the big, um, the big reason to be married is your own personal happiness. You'll never be happy. Never. Not if that's the only thing you care about. Every single person in your life disappoints you. There's not a single person that anybody can mention that hasn't no. upset them or offended them slightly, anything. Everybody yeah. has offended everybody in their life. <laughs> it's a complete backwards um, mentality. It's a completely backwards. And I think this lady's just taking it a step further. You know, now she's at the point of why get married at all? Why even be in a committed relationship at all? Just make me happy for the moment and then move along, right? It's complete selfishness. Um, Do you want to read this statement? Yeah, she says, To me, solo polyamory means having relationships that are fulfilling, meaningful, and loving. But my primary relationship is with myself. Well, that's true. (laughs) And there was something she said that I, it stood out to me. So she says, I'm in relationships, but I'm not looking to get on the relationship escalator where there's the expectation that you're dating, then you get serious, then you're exclusive, then partners, 
and then maybe you get married or form a domestic partnership. So I don't understand these stages she's talking about here. So if that's the way people date, whatever it means to go from dating to getting serious, exclusive in partners, what does partners mean? What do, I want a definition of what these things mean because there's like five things that lead to getting married or a domestic partnership. Are there five stages? Because she thinks like that's what she's trying to avoid. Well, this is like maybe the Netflix relationship where it's like we meet each other, then we sleep together, and then he tells me he loves me. That's the third <laughs> step. And then we move in together. And then 10 years later, he asked me to marry him. Oh, like, I think he got the whole thing backwards there. But, so she uh, says, I'm not looking to get on that relationship escalator. Yeah, nobody should be. That's what I wanted to point out. It's like, well, if that's what she thinks it is, then yeah, that don't sound good. <laughs> no, because, well, even still, right, it's not ideal, but also somewhere along that line, the so-called partner you're with may actually expect something from you to make them happy. And that just don't make you happy. So best to just bail early. At least she's got this article here. She's being honest and warning people. I don't give her any credit for this article. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. Um, she says in here, just right below <clears throat> that, she says, because our culture is so uh, monogamous, when people hear about non-monogamy, they think of cheating and secrecy. But for me, uh, non-monogamy or polyamory is about openness, honesty, and being true to yourself in a radically honest way. Doesn't that just sound so modern? Be true <laughs> and nurture yourself. Like <laughs> I'm nourishing myself in a radically honest way. Sounds like something a PhD at a state university might teach a a class of young women or something like that, doesn't it? Isn't it funny how you can repaint sin to sound appealing? Yeah. I'm not prideful. I'm nourishing myself in a ra radically honest way. Wow. Oh, you're prideful. Um, but in reality, this is just complete made-up nonsense. Um, I'm just being true to myself, she, she says. She sounds right? like one of those ladies in the interview on the What is a Woman just the weird way they well, would describe right. things. Yeah. This is just another extension of, you know, the transgender mindset where, yeah. you know, my truth is my truth and yeah, your Yeah, because everything is, your is truth like, and, to me, it means this. Everything is your definition. So it's okay. I know that you don't understand it, you know, polyamory and just sleeping around with everybody that I meet. It seems scary to you, but to me, it's just radically honest. You're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Just think of how just like... just saying words that don't make any sense. What about like a psychopath, like a murderer, trying to make his reasoning sound so nice and flowery too? <laughs> yes, you call what Ron Jeremy did rape and sexual assault. He was just being radically honest with himself. <laughs> that was rape and sexual assault, and he's a pervert. Uh. Um, but like, that's, you know, it's complete made up nonsense wrapped in, you know, I guess, university speak, if you will. Yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, right, it's just I'm the only person that matters and making myself happy is the only thing that matters. She said and she's in a relationship with herself first. Yes, because she's the only one that matters, right? So me first. She's in a relationship with herself. If you can make her happy for a time, cool. If you can't, someone else can. And, you know, boy. Doesn't the world need more of that? Her poor ex-husband. <laughs> like, well, if this is the kind of person, the way that she already thought, like the selfishness in yeah, the marriage. Yeah, who knows what kind of a husband she had. The child. That's true, yeah. Heaven poor have kid. mercy on the kid. But, you know, do you think that this is what's going to fix the nation? That this is what's going to fix what ails us in this nation? Just more, she called it radical honesty. It's radical selfishness is what it is. And is that what this nation needs? More radical, unconstrained selfishness? I would say no. Um, that is not what we need. Mm. Um, there's a couple more points she said down here. She says, right now, I'm practicing solo polyamory, and it's really wonderful. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I was always polyamorous in the past, or I might always be in the future. 
I'm open to solo polyamory ending for me, especially when I look at people in their late 70s and think, wow, it's really great they have each other. I could see myself having one primary relationship later in life. No, that's the same way of thinking that people who are like, when, you know, when I'm older and I'm done living my life, then I'll call on the Lord to save me. No, you won't. And she won't be in a committed relationship with anybody either later on. No, and no, I mean, you don't it change. may look committed from the outside, but it's still a selfish reason, right? Because mm-hmm. she's like, well, I'm 70 now. Um, and I think this is really the key, right? Because she isn't um, polyamorous, really. Um, and pardon my language, I would say that's just a fancy term for putting on her um, lustful desires that she's given um, priority in her life. That's all it is. And I think she's reaching the waning years of her attractiveness, if you will, to the opposite sex. And she doesn't want to waste it, right? She's in her mid 50s now. You know, um, women are, you know, extending their beauty, if you will, into their 50s and 60s and stuff. Some of these actresses, but probably knows it's waning, right? Getting the most use out of that, if you will. Um, so at least this is the way I read when I read these statements like this. You know, I maybe in my 70s, I might be ready to, you know, spend my life with someone or I'll have someone care for me to grow no. old with me. And, you know, she realizes that her attractiveness might fade. And when it happens, well, then she'd like to have a guy to grow old with. Maybe someone to take care of her. More selfishness, I would assume. I would just, when I read the whole article and I see a statement like that, I just assume it's for selfish reasons. You know, She'll look for that then when she needs it, but she doesn't really want to let these last few years of good old sexual immorality go to waste. So she's going to make use of them now, but realizing, well, when I'm older, I may not be able to do this, or I just may not have the desire for sexual immorality. I may want someone to take care of me. So I'll find that then. Again, like you said, it's just all me, 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 me. It's self-focused. It's selfishness. Um, It's just getting, I mean... You know, the way your selfishness is being serviced might look different. It's not these sexual relationships. It's having a guy care for you in your old age, but it's still all about you. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but this is what I talk or what I mentioned when she says she highlights the reason why her and her husband weren't compatible. She says right down here, part of the tension between us was due to mismatched sex drives and different needs not being met. So again... Sexual gratification was her driving force, not love, not relationships, just lust. Her husband didn't satisfy her. And again, you know, it's a biblical mandate to, you know, accommodate your spouse in that way. But even still, that's the point, right? She's like, I, we weren't matched up in our sex drives. So I had to cut him loose and go, you know, find those who would meet me where I am. And uh, then again, later in life, when I no longer have that sex drive, I'll find someone that can service the other needs that I have, like, you know, support and care and these things. And it's just, it's all selfishness, in my opinion. Um, So, you know, why is this important to Christians, right? Why are we talking about polyamory? Um, You know, and that's, a very, you know, specific focus here. But the larger focus, I think, is that everything in this world is striving to make us self-centered, to make us self-focused. And nearly everything Christ commanded us to do was about being focused on others. Uh, The good of others, yep. Yeah, so we need to decide who we're going to serve. Are we going to serve ourselves, like Jennifer Keller, or are we going to serve Christ? Um, Mm -hmm. Like if your spouse can't give you something you want, that doesn't mean you abandon them. No, I mean, and we have terms for this like gold digger, right? Where a woman who, the husband or whatever, can't make the money that she wants. So she finds, you know, a sugar daddy or something to that effect, right? Those are terms that we know of. Yes, Um, yes. And, you know, men do it as well, right? You know, the doctors that get into their 50s or whatever, and they've got money, but maybe their spouse who they were married to is getting older. And they, I mean, guys do the same thing, right? I've got a few years left where I can really, you know, what is it called? Sowing your wild oats or whatever they call it. So they go out and they find the young 20-year-old girl and ditch the wife. And it's the same sin, just, you know, in different forms. It's all about me servicing my needs and my desires. Um, And you'll discard and, you know, anybody that you have to. 
ruin families like Jennifer did here to go and satisfy your own desires. Um, you know, Jennifer Keller, she's made her choice, right? So the question for us is what choice are we going to make? You know, your marriage isn't about you. Uh, it's about your spouse. It's about your children. It's about God. It's about your relationship to God. Um, you know, life isn't about chasing your own pleasures at every turn. It's about seeking God's will at every turn. And a lot of times dying to your own desires and your own, you know, pleasures, your fleshly pleasures. But this is what it comes to. Like, look how messed up it gets when you don't live the way that God intended. When you don't, you don't know God. Look at all the things you make up and you make yourself God. That's what you do. Right. And that's, I think we've said it on this show before, living according to the Ten Commandments is the freest you'll ever live. Mm -hmm. Once you delve away from, you dive away from those and you give in to your sinful impulses, you just become a slave to everything. And nobody likes you. <laughs> I doubt this lady has any friends. <laughs> oh, you think you want her around your husband? Or, or you know, if or your friend or your sister, your daughter? You're like, don't talk to Jennifer. She's going to lead you astray. <laughs> Don't listen to what she, her life is messed up. I mean, up, there's right? even, I mean, even well, unbelievers know this is crazy. Uh, except mean, for Yahoo. They think it's awesome. But, um, you know, from, I looked up some stats on this, but from 2006 um, till now, or maybe to 2019, uh, let me see if I can pull these up. I had these uh, links saved here just so you guys can see that I'm not making this up. I actually went to the interwebs and I found these <laughs> just so I could talk to you about them. Uh, it said, um, right, where was it? Yeah, right here. From 2006 until, I think this was just 2013, so it's probably gotten much worse. Um, again, wow. I just looked this up briefly, but the percentage of people who see marriage as important when a man and a woman want to spend their life together has decreased from 73% to 64%. And that was just in seven years. Oh um, gosh. and then in this other article, uh, let me see if I can find the one that I was looking for. Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it says in here, over 62% of the population support same-sex marriage, right? So they don't even know what marriage is. Um, they support same-sex marriage. And then this other Pew Research poll talks about from 1990 until 2019, the percentage of adults that were either single or just cohabitating has increased from 33% to 47%. So you know, everywhere you look, you know, a lack of desire for marriage or even a lack of understanding of what real marriage is seems to be growing, you know, and this desire for self-gratification seems to be increasing. So, you know, we as Christians, we need to speak against these ideas, um, at least to our loved ones. And then, of course, resist the temptations in our own lives because we all have these own, you know, we have self-gratifying desires in our own life. We're all prideful and selfish to some degree or another that we have to die to. Um, you know, and just on the topic of marriage, like my, marriage is God-given. Um, raising godly families is commanded of us to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and it's really the only real and substantial way that we have of influencing a culture over the long term is to have kids train them up in godliness and righteousness, and then they grow up and have kids and train them in godliness and righteousness. That's mm -hmm. sort of the plan. Yeah. And the less people get married, the less people want to have kids. Those stats are out there. Less and less people are having kids now. Mm -hmm. um, our nation's even under the rate of, uh, what's it called? Like the rate of, um, basically our nation's declining that, based yeah. on our birth rate you know, our nation is diminishing. We're not yeah. growing anymore. This is why we're probably bringing in so many, um, this is at least my thoughts, this is why we're bringing in so many immigrants, because it tricks us into thinking our nation's growing, when in fact, our populace isn't having kids anymore, and we're declining as a nation. But we're tricking ourselves, we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, napkin math here with immigrants to make us think that the nation's still growing and thriving, when people 
don't want to get married. They don't want to have kids. They just want to make money, buy trinkets and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. party or whatever it happens to be. I don't know, but, uh, not good, you know? So what should we do about it? Um, well, I yeah. don't know. I was thinking, <laughs> how many people are going to read this article? You know, as she stumbled upon the idea and like, oh, that's a good idea for me to live like that. How many people are going to read this article and think that's a good idea? She just makes it sound so positive. Well, like that's a-, a lot will. And I'm sure that's the reason why Yahoo, and there's probably a lot that are, right? This is, again, people are single. They're not getting married. Um, they're cohabitating, you know, um, the Tinder relationship kind of things is essentially what this is. I'm just hooking up with people, you know, for a time. And then, you know, there's no real commitment there. Like, this is obviously a thing. That's. A- I mean, when you read the Bible, it was really important for the wife to have a son to carry on the name of the father. Nobody cares about their name being carried on. No, nobody cares about their name anymore. Um, They care about, again, it's a pridefulness and a selfishness, right? And that's, again, why people are having less kids, because kids are a burden. You know, it's a lot easier and beneficial for you if you and your wife both go and get full-time jobs. You can buy nice cars. You can take vacations, do all these sorts of things that kids kind of just get in the way of. And all they do is give you progeny. All they do is carry on your name and legacy throughout the generations, but they don't Mm. give you trinkets, right? And they don't give you uh, nice new MacBook Pros and all the little niceties of life. So why have them anymore? You know, who knows? Mm. Maybe when you're 50, you can go and get one artificially inseminated in you. And, uh, you know, then when you want a little doll to play with because you're older, then you can have your little you know, uh, artificially inseminated kid to go with you. It's a crazy world. It's crazy. I really admire my grandpa, uh, my mom's dad. When his wife, my grandma passed away, this was 2000, what was it? 2000, (laughs) the year 2000, I think. Um, Y2K got her. I'm just <laughs> I think it was. Gosh, I can't even think straight. I was in high school. Um, yeah, he just downsized, got rid of, like, he was never materialistic anyway. He just ended up moving into a studio apartment, the bare necessities. He was the most giving person. And a couple days before he passed, I was in, in Michigan with the kids and he was happy because he got to see his great grandchildren. Like that was important. Family was everything to him. Like that was just amazing that we got to even see him. We didn't know he was going to pass, but just, I praise God that we were there the day we're losing. I think we just talked about that in our group on Friday night, how, you know, one of our or a group leader, you know, was going into old retirement homes and just mm-hmm. you know, how sad it is to see, you know, a lot of these older folks that are just shuffled off to retirement homes. The kids, you know, show up at, at the start and then they show up less and less. And the grandparents, the parents are just sort of, you know, spending the rest of their life there just kind of waiting for the Lord to come take them, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's sad, right? It's not the way that family is supposed to be, but you know, we got our own life to live, right? That's what we tell ourselves. And, you know, yeah. we got, we're busy with work and we're busy Even with whatever. Even if you don't and... have kids, you need to put your parents first. You need to care for your your mother or your father or even your, your grandparents if they're still alive. I mean, serve somebody. Like, be important to somebody's life. Like, if you're living, if your life just for you your most important relationship is with yourself. Like, you're not important to anybody. You're just, nobody's Nikki, thankful for you. You just don't get the <laughs> radical honesty. Um, no, yeah. I know, absolutely. I think so deeply in these things. I'm just like, if this, then this is how, this is what it really means. This is how others view you. That's a cold heart 
let's, I know we're all dead in our sins before we're born again, but it's like seeing how heartless you can get, you know, it's scary. That's just, it's sad. Um, And that's the thing, right? We're, you know, and again, why should, or what should we do about it, right, as Christians? And we're obviously talking about marriage a little bit, and that's kind of a focus here, but uh, this extends far beyond marriage. Uh, I think Christians need to be self-sacrificial in all areas of our life. That should be our mindset. You know, we should be self-sacrificial with our, or sacrificial with our time, with our money, in our marriages, in our child rearing, even in the church, right? We should be sacrificial everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, we should be looking for ways to serve others rather than to be served. And it's not easy. I mean, Jennifer Keller is not unique. Um, she's right. like all of us, right? We're all sinful humans. Um, but we at least need to recognize um, that sacrifice is right in a godly way of living. You know, the old G.I. G. Joe slogan of knowing is half the battle, right? We at least have to know that being sacrificial and putting others' needs above ours is the right way to do it. Um, and this story is a dramatic example. Um, I get that. You know, and most of us are never going to go to the extreme of Jennifer Keller. But we need to be instructing our children in the ways of godly living. And we need to be studying and praying so that we're not just talking about it to them, but we're being an example to them as well. You know, this woman, Jennifer Keller, right, she's ruined her marriage. Um, she's damaged her child's life through divorce. And it's all so that she could make herself more happy. You know, you would think that as she was being interviewed or writing this out to Yahoo, I don't know how it worked, um, that would have dawned on her. But, you know, pride has a way of just blinding you. It causes you to not really see the damage that you cause to others. I know, yep. Um, And, you know, we need God to show us that damage. And if he is gracious enough to show us the damage that we caused, Uh, sadly, sometimes it's too late to even fix it, um, or to prevent it. So, um, you know, we need to be hearing this stuff, paying attention to it and going to God, you know, early before it's too late, right before the damage is caused. Um, you know, it would have been great if when she was suffering in this marriage and realizing there were problems, you know, if she would have found God and went to him in prayer and her and her husband worked through these things, um, that's a that's a success story. I mean, that's a hero, you know, saving a marriage to um, bless the life of her kid. I mean, that's that's a hero's tale. That's mm-hmm. how it ended up is yeah. not, you know, that's that's not a hero's tale in any way, no matter how she claims it to be radically honest or whatever it is. Um, but so how should we pray about it? Because Christians should pray about everything. Well, again, I think, you know, once we're um, made aware of the dangers of selfishness and self-gratification, um, which Nikki and I have just done for you and for ourselves as well, where we've been made aware of it again, uh, we need to go to God in prayer. And we need to ask that he would show us where we've sort of placed ourselves or our own wants and needs above others. Uh, and if that was right or wrong, again, there's t- probably times, right, when you place your own needs above others. Um, you need to feed yourself so that you can actually go to work and provide for your family. That's important, um, those sorts of things. But ask God to show you where you've placed yourself above others in a way that's selfish. Um, and where he shows you those, then repent. You know, mm-hmm. Be quick to repent about that stuff. Um, but then I think follow that up with asking God to give us humility, um, give us a servant's heart, and give us a desire to place others' needs um, and others just in general is higher than ourselves, I think is something we need to pray for because that's not easy either, right? Um, It doesn't Mm -hmm. come naturally to us. Only God can give us a desire, a a servant's heart in that way. Right. Um, But we need that desire if we are actually going to live lives that honor God. You need to live that way if you're going to honor God. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope this episode made sense. You know, I know it maybe is a weird topic to focus on to try to get to the broader point of selfishness and um, our mm-hmm. pride and that sort of stuff that we need to die to. Uh, I hope we didn't drive anyone away. Hope that you stuck around with us. But do you have any final thoughts on this topic or really just anything that we talked about up to this point? I mean, every time there's something, some article or some person is being proud of their sin, 
it is opportunity for all of us to pray for that person that we would have never known their name. Now we know her name and we're going to pray for her. Yeah, we will pray for Jennifer. Um, pray that God would open her eyes. And again, anytime you talk about stuff like this, you always got to give the caveat that we're talking about ourselves too, right? Me and me and Nikki are not supposing that oh gosh, yeah. we are <laughs> the ones that are instructing you on how you should live like us. Um, we need your prayers just as much as Jennifer Keller needs our prayers. And we're just as liable to stumble and we will stumble, right? Of course, no one's going to walk through this life completely humble and um, self-sacrificial. We're sinful humans, but um, hopefully when we do that, we'll be quick to repent. So, uh, yeah, hope, hope this made sense to you guys, what we were trying to get at here. So for our recommended listening for today, um, we're going to include a three-part series that Nikki and I did um, on marriage, because that was kind of the main topic, even though it was a leading us to a, you know, or that was kind of the lead into a bigger topic, if you will. But, you know, we were talking about marriage, so... For our 100th episode, we just hit our 200th epi- 200th episode last episode, so we're on episode 201 now. <laughs> so 100 episodes ago, we did sort of a three-part series on marriage. Look at that first one, 44 minutes long. Those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we looked at it just basically how to have a good marriage and then how to be a good wife and how to be a good husband and, you know, three different videos. So, you know, go give them a listen, listen, if you want, um, let us know what you think in the comments about those. We tried to make them somewhat practical and not just like open up to Ephesians. You're like, okay, I got it. But what does that look like in real life? You know? Um, but please go read Ephesians. We're not telling you not to read Ephesians. Um, but yeah, go give those a listen. Let us know what you think of those in the comments. But otherwise, Uh, We'll be back next week, like we said early in the start, probably discussing Sarah Young again. I do hope you listen. I think it's really important what this girl has written. Um, Because again, like everything, it extends beyond Sarah Young. She's just um, the focal point, if you will. Right. Um, And then also next Sunday, we'll be kicking off again with our devotionals. So excited about that. But... Otherwise, that is all we got. Hope you guys have a great week. God bless.